Iowa City is a unique community. This uniqueness is shaped by the people who contribute their ideas, their time, and their energy to the life of Iowa City and the university. Welcome to a series of biographical interviews of special women and men who have affected this community. Their lifelong contributions have been valuable, their lives creative and full. What brought them here? Who influenced them? What contributions are they the most pleased about? These and other questions will be explored during this series of interviews entitled, Tell Me Your Story. The environment, preservation, and beauty mean a lot to Nancy Cyberling. You may find Nancy planting or pruning a shrub, tree, or flower on one of Iowa City's many streets and entrances. You may find her actively involved with local governmental boards to make and keep Iowa City beautiful. You may find her working to preserve the state's natural habitats as a trustee of the Iowa Nature Conservancy. She also may be found supporting preservation by serving as president of the Johnson County Heritage Tr Trust. Project Green and Nancy Cyberling go hand in hand, or should I say hand and trowel. She was one of the founders working with the late Gretchen Harshbarger of this community beautification organization. It was founded in 1967. So much of the beauty of Iowa City, from the mini parks downtown to the Chauncey Swan parking area, to the restored trees at Plum Grove, to the plantings on Iowa, Melrose, Washington, Gilbert, Highway 6 Bypass, and Muscatine are all there thanks to the efforts of the Project Green members, Gretchen Harshberger and Nancy Cyberling. Nancy, welcome to Tell Me Your Story. Thank you. You've been here about 30 years in Iowa City. That's right. We came in 1959. Tell us where you came from and what brought you here. We had lived in Ohio before. My husband taught, at the, he was head of the art department at the uh, um, Ohio State University. And uh, people at Iowa thought they'd like to have him come here. So he, was, he came to be head of the department here. Mm -hmm. And we arrived in the fall of 1959. Were you always interested in gardening and planting and landscaping? Has this been a love all your life? I wasn't always interested in it in a continuous way, mm -hmm. but I subliminally, I think my, I had connections with it all along. I think one of my earliest memories is of following my father, putting seeds in the ground when I was about three, and one of those shadowy recollections that goes way back. Mm -hmm. And I always loved the uh, countryside. We used to have a go in the summer to an old house in New Hampshire, which had a lovely outlook over the uh, over the Lineboro Hills. And there, it was always a pleasure to see in every every season of the year the shape of the landscape and the kinds of plants that grew there. So it was something that I lived in and enjoyed, mm -hmm. without trying to um, uh, improve in any way at that stage. My father always encouraged me to have a garden, and I managed to have it in the shade where it didn't grow well, and I didn't really <laughs> like to weed, and so I did it because he was devoted to gardening and had a beautiful garden, and uh, doing a great deal of work in it with not too much time available. So I, it was always there on the side, you know, I, and I, I, when Frank and I were married, we lived in an apartment on the second floor in Toledo, Ohio, and uh, there was no place to garden, but we did between the uh, sidewalk and the, in, in the backyard, where the sidewalk and the driveway, plant some daffodils, and we put some flowers out in the alley. So I think that we shared a gardening, <laughs> with gardening operation for the time that we were married. He uh, was devoted to gardens and had a beautiful garden at his home and always uh, was interested in, in this in garden design. And that was something that we've always shared together. You grew up in the East yes, and went to school at Wellesley? At Wellesley. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Winchester, a small, lovely town outside Massachusetts. And I remember going back there when I'd been away for 20 years and thought, isn't this town wonderful? Why, there are these gorgeous trees everywhere. <laughs> you see, I, it had been part of my experience growing up. And you, you don't look at what you, you don't sort of, you're not too much aware of what, you, what happens to you mm -hmm. when you're growing up. You just accept it. You go back and look at it, you think, Good heavens, <laughs> this is <laughs> remarkable. So, so you, it, you're... Um, it was in my consciousness. It was in your consciousness. Yes. And then you came from back east to Ohio mm -hmm. to Iowa. Mm -hmm. What, when you got here, what were your interests in? What did you decide you wanted to do with your time and energies? Well, you would be interested to know that the very first person I met in Iowa City 
at a very lovely dinner party given by the Dean of Liberal Arts with the heads of departments there. Well, and there sitting in, the, uh, in that West Lounge area of the Union was Gretchen Harshbarger, dressed in that wonderful color that she always wore, sitting in a chair. And we, she was the first person I met. And I don't know that I was polite to anyone else that evening because we had such a wonderful time talking about gardens. Oh. And so this is how I picked up right away on what was going to be important for me in Iowa City without realizing it then. Isn't it fascinating how things like this well, will happen to you? Yes. yes. Well, so you met Gretchen, and then how did this, this uh, emerge, this Project Green, this wonderful organization that well, the two of you were so closely associated with? Well, Gretchen was uh, asked by Billy Barnes, then head of the business school, to be one of the to head up one of the committees uh, uh, that was called CBIC, Citizens for a Better Iowa City. And uh, he had, had insisted that along with education, transportation, commerce, and all of that, should be a beautification committee. And Gretchen knew all about beautification because she had traveled all over the U.S. and photographed gardens and written garden articles for 20 or 30 years. And she knew that any town that was going to look like anything at all worth living in had a, a beautification committee. And so she gathered people together to, uh, we, which, we, as we say, as I like to say, we invented Project mm -hmm. Green. And this was architects and landscape architects, city planners, and practical gardeners like me. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and these, out of this group, you see, Project Green started. So her strong suit was her knowledge, her, her professional national background, ba base, yes. and her drawing people her in yours. What, what role then did you play? Well, I think that putting things together, you know, I was the That's gopher. What I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, making connections, mm -hmm. and uh, because that was not uh, Gretchen, that was not something that she was. In, she was designing. She had wonderful ideas, very inspiring. You know, just the vit just her vitality and her her vision was so exciting. And the book was a you know was Excellent. a many people's yes. uh, and like still a is. dictionary that yeah, it still is. So it was published in 1968. And still is. And the title for people who aren't mm -hmm. familiar with it is McCall's Gardening McCall's Book. McCall's Gardening mm -hmm. Book. So Garden Book, I guess. It Garden is. Book. So the group started, and then when did the name Project Green get attached to this? Very in 1968 when we first emerged, and we were doing Iowa Avenue, and I had to. I was going to make a talk to the Altrusa Club. They were the first to hear about it, and that was the first uh, time that the Project Green was uh, was mm -hmm. was sort of announced as what we were doing. And then who devised the name Green and for other well, for new people to town, <laughs> tell them what it means. <coughs> oh, yes. Well, Green, uh, which is an acronym, stands for Grow to Reach Environmental Excellence Now. <laughs> and <laughs> that has been uh, very vital. And uh, I think it has a lot of uh, dynamic potential mm -hmm. there and, and it still is working. You early people, when you started, how did you decide where in the city you should begin your attention. Well, that's attention. very important, and that was uh, absolutely Gretchen's direction because she felt that whenever you come into a city, you should feel welcome, or you should have some kind of signification that this this is a wonderful place. And if you come in and there are dreadful signs, or it's not very attractive, or things look down at the hill, it doesn't give you a very good impression mm -hmm. of the community. And so the first project that we worked on was was not Dubuque Street because the the city had planted that the uh, year before, uh, and that was in 1966. But in 1967, she pointed out that Isle Avenue, which is a major entrance to the business district downtown, and which is in a very disheveled state, should be, uh, should be re revitalized. They, there was a plan which she had drawn and was available, and she said, if we can raise half the money for this, then the rest of it will come in because people can see what it is that we're talking about when we say it, it's important to create mm -hmm. uh, a, a very a handsome um, and handsomely planted situation. So that's, that's so where Iowa we're. Avenue was Iowa first. Avenue was the first one. And then where did your then it was go? followed by uh, the Highway Six bypass. Now you see that was at that time from the center of the road either way was 150 feet of highway and then absolutely nothing from the uh, Wardway, into what's now the Wardway intersection, out way beyond Procter & Gamble. A new highway put in. The uh, uh, Department of Transportation didn't have money for plantings. So this, as uh, a major entrance, and really a very significant one mm -hmm. to the city, 
we started to do, and, and we, we, we planted there on three different uh, uh, programs, 1979, uh, 1969, 71, and 73, all the way out to uh, Lakeside Manor, what it is, up beyond Procter & Gamble. I don't know if people realize that not only did you plant these trees, you tended them over yes. the years and pruned them. I used to see people out pruning the trees and weeding around the trees, and now they're magnificent. And wrapping them for the uh, protection against uh, uh, scorch from the sun or rabbits from mm -hmm. the winter. We had a crew of people that met every Thursday morning, and that first year, if you can believe it, every Thursday morning was absolutely beautiful. This was in the fall. And we all had an absolutely marvelous time doing this. And this went on for, for several years. We'd also come in the spring and, and to mow around them to try to mm -hmm. encourage them. And it certainly has made a difference because if you've oh. driven down there, if you drove down the bypass last spring, uh, you'd see what, what can happen in 20 years. It's 20 years, it's if you can imagine. It's magnificent. And it really is splendid. It is. The entrances are so lovely. What about... Tell, tell the viewers also who aren't familiar that with the, your involvement in the bike path along Rocky Shore Drive, which is wonderful. I, I always wished it were five times longer, but it's a, such an expensive project, and Project Green was involved with that, too. Yes, as a matter of fact, in 1969, uh, Marianne Milkman, uh, now in the city planning department, headed uh, a committee, the, the Bikeways Committee, because we felt that, if, that to uh, make uh, to have places for people to ride bicycles in and out of the city would not only uh, be good to take some of the transportation off the street, but also it would bring them in contact with uh, very interesting natural areas. And she and her committee developed the uh, Hawkeye Bikeway system, which involved um, going a, a bike path through City Park, of course, out to the reservoir, and also along Rocky Shore Drive. And she, they wanted to go they thought it would be nice to go along the river to Carlville, but they didn't think that could be done. Mm -hmm. But it was something that they thought about. And now it was in 1983 that the city finally was able to get the riprap to strengthen the bank along the river. And so uh, that was one dream that came true. When that uh, was completed, we provided the landscaping for that uh, area. And uh, just recently, the Carlville Council has said that they will accept our offer to help them uh, build uh, the, the Carlville connection. And this is a bikeway which, in fact, will be between the railroad and the river, the thing it's, that was originally thought couldn't be done and it's going to be done, maybe starting right now. If it's raining right now, it'll be starting in a few days. How wonderful. Isn't that exciting? So Rocky Shore will... So you can, you'll be able to, ro to go from, from downtown Iowa City or even from farther east all the way to Carlville on a bicycle. By going out, you see along the, the bike path along the, the river through right. the university area, on along Park Road, which is a bike bikeway, right. along Rocky Shore Drive, down through Crandick Park, and, and then, then take along a right on Crandick Park and then between the railroad, the railroad and the river. And it's not just going to be a, a bikeway; it'll, it's a we like to call it a paved nature path because people, handicapped people, can get out of a wheel, get, get out of the car in a wheelchair, and go have a, an experience of going along by the river. It, it, with no cars, no transportation, nothing but a kind of natural setting. And we think that this is a very nice thing to make this facility available. Will you keep it in wildflowers? Oh, yes. We eventually, uh, it's right now in poison ivy, and we ha expect to uh, be able to vanquish <laughs> that. And to, it's because it's just a woodland area, mm -hmm. very simple, and we will see that there are the, the appropriate kinds of things will grow there. That is truly That's exciting. Wonderful. It's very news. exciting. Let's talk about the Green Garden Fair, that has emerged as something that everybody waits for in the spring that uh, draws hundreds and hundreds of people and you make thousands and thousands of dollars. It is very successful. Uh, this was proposed, first of all, by Gretchen. I can just remember the meeting at which she said, do you think we could possibly uh, do this describing how she'd seen this kind mm -hmm. of thing happen before? And as a matter of fact, people were enchanted by this, and that first year, I remember, we were thrilled to pieces because I think we made $1,750. That was in 1971, and uh, when that was with a fairly small group of mm -hmm. people. Now we have literally hundreds of people helping us, and last year we made it uh, more than $25,000 um, within three hours. But the, the money, and the money's marvelous because it helps us with our programs, and of course this is matched by generous contributions from people who really do appreciate mm -hmm. what we do. But the thing that is so terrific is people, uh, all these people are getting together 
they're sharing from their own gardens, they're sharing their work, they're sharing their time, and all the plants that are sold go to benefit Iowa City. Mm -hmm. So Iowa City becomes more beautiful, and it's, the whole thing is just, just very serendipitous. You're going to continue that on for as long as you can have volunteers? We didn't. People? Well, Gretchen always said she just didn't know how people would con want to work that hard. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the magic is, of course, getting together, doing things together. The sense of it's a creative process, and it is, of course, hard work. But it's something that people do, uh, with a lot of complaining, of course, when you're strapped for time and all of that, mm -hmm. but there's a wonderful sense of being able to accomplish it and, and of, of vanquishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, it's very exhilarating, mm -hmm. and it's very rewarding, and the, and the friendships that people make, and, and then they learn a great deal about plants. Mm -hmm. They learn about um, planting seeds and raising plants under lights or pruning shrubs or doing all that kind of thing. So everybody gains mm -hmm. from it. Part of the success, the continuing success of that, is I know people have commented that you have such an ability to get others to work with you and that it's also hard to say no to you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I never mind asking people to do things because I know what a wonderful experience mm -hmm. that we all have together. For instance, when we go down to work on Rocky Shore Drive, which we do weed, and it's very hard work, and especially the last two summers, it's been terrible because it's been so dry. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, drudgery. Who, nobody really gets, but everybody has a good time, and we appreciate, you appreciate what's, what's happened because of it. I mean, here is this wonderful result that's such a pleasure to see, and you know it wouldn't be happening if you weren't there. And there's just a sense of, um, of, of what, a sort of joyous cooperation can bring about. Mm -hmm. And people are, there, of course, there are some people who don't respond that way. You, you know who the people who are, who, mm -hmm. you are the people who are going to respond. And so it's, uh, you just give a wonderful opportunity to people. Who can resist? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I think gardeners stay young. I really do. <laughs> I, well, you have to, I think, if you wanted to <laughs> stay well, in Bend the over and pull weeds. Yes. Um, what, looking at your life, what event or person influenced you the most, Nancy? Well, um, th uh, th there were several. Um, one of the first ones was a professor I had at Wellesley, uh, Serape Dernasesian, a mar marvelous, magical, tiny Armenian woman. She was a very gifted scholar. Her field was the Byzantine manuscripts. And um, she, like Jim Van Allen here, loved to teach uh, beginning students. Mm -hmm. You know, ordinarily if you take Art 101, you don't, you have a graduate assistant mm -hmm. or something like that. And this course that I took was so wonderful that I just couldn't, just, it was art history, I just couldn't wait for the next opportunity to uh, take another course with her or, or some other courses. And I took a lot of courses in art history, which, and said so this, she was very, very influential, uh, an excellent teacher and one who knew how to work with, with a neophyte students and to um, help direct them and inspire them. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, my involvement in art is something that has really followed all through my life and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I think one of the great things about studying art history is that no matter where you are or what city you're in, anywhere in the world, you have something to enjoy in terms of the, just the architecture but when you go down a street mm -hmm. or art museums or it, there's always something to be enjoyed. It's a very fulfilling kind of study, very just the kind of thing you'd like to recommend to everybody because it so can expand your life experience. So this woman was very, very influential. Yes, yeah, she was very influential. And then uh, Gretchen, I would say, was the person who also gave at, at, a, at a time in my life when you know, my children were then going to college and uh, at that age one is looking for something that is going to be really exciting to do and she here was this remarkable person who came along with these wonderful ideas and uh, it, it was involved with, with the gardening with which I was interested in and able to give time to then. And also I always have had a sense of wanting to do, be involved in things that have uh, uh, some kind of positive or exciting potential for realization. Well you've been involved in the design review committee. Just mm -hmm. share a few things about that. Well that is a very interesting committee. Uh, very, <laughs> it's. Uh, we, we all know that the quality of, the, of our surroundings 
does affect us. If it's disorderly and, and unkempt, it's very depressing, and you're constantly presented with problems to solve, and you don't really know how to do it. It's a very depressing kind of thing. Whereas if it's, if it's orderly or if it's beautiful, then you are free to develop your own ideas. And I, that's putting it terribly simply, but I think that is really pretty much what's involved in having an environment that is uh, very thoughtfully designed and geared to serving people well in, in terms of beauty and utility. Mm -hmm. And therefore, how do, you, how do you kind of protect that? Well, it's very helpful to have people who have some background in design to guide others and giving, uh, heightening their perception, uh, giving, them, giving them ways to do things that are more successful than others. It's partly education and it's partly direction and it's partly pressure <laughs> 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 that you hope won't be uh, interpreted anything except encouragement. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, so the design, actually design review is something that there were various people in Project Green, the, the architects and the city planners felt was very important to for the for Project Green to encourage the institution of a design review mm -hmm. committee. And as it turned out, we worked on this and lobbied with this, and there was some support from the city without really coming to a conclusion until urban renewal. And then one of the, one of the givens for receiving the grants that they had was to have a design review committee. And so then, then it was set up, and members were appointed. And they were appointed until the urban renewal, whole, whole urban renewal project would be complete. Well, you see, there's still one lot that is not finished yet, and when that is done, then the urban renewal will be complete, so the committee will disband. It, it will disband. <laughs> but uh, meanwhile, there are uh, three of us, I think, who have been on the committee since the beginning, whereas others have uh, had to re re retire, and, uh, so, and new ones have come on. But we do meet and we do consider things that have to do with the... Uh, uh, now it's mostly concerned with the downtown plaza because that is still under the purview of the committee. Mm -hmm. It is a lovely downtown. I, we thank you for all your efforts <laughs> on that. And now also you're interested in preservation. You're now yes. serving in the Johnson County Heritage Trust. Tell us about that. Well, the Heritage Trust is a very, you, you might think of it as a kind of terribly miniature nature conservancy oh. without, uh, because it, uh, it uh, we realize that there are precious areas, natural areas, in uh, Johnson County that can be exploited and or, or, or used for farmland that could be saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, little, for instance, a two acre patch of prairie. Mm. It would be much better to have that in, in the prairie than it would be to sell it for, uh, for the owner to s let it go for some commercial purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there are areas where there are woods that have beautiful wildflowers up near Turkey Creek. A, gr a group of owners there gave to the Heritage Trust the Turkey Creek Preserve, which has very beautiful wildflowers and is just to be left intact, to be kept. It does have to be protected from invasions mm -hmm. of, uh, of grasses, and the, so there is some prairie restoration that goes on there. But this is, our, our efforts are very modest, but we want people to realize how the, when these natural areas vanish, there's absolutely nothing that tells us what the past was, what the natural past mm -hmm. was in Johnson County. And if, without these, we, we, we lose some of our history, some of the connections, and it's very important to try to make people aware of what their, their, the initial state of nature was here and to try to keep some of those areas. Mm -hmm. and so that other succeeding generations can enjoy them. When you're not pruning a tree or digging in the dirt or planning for the city, what, are your, what holds your interest, Nancy? I know art does. And, uh, yes, and, and I think that it's, uh, it's something that I would like to spend more time on. As I do less gardening, then I would like to uh, spend, go back and... Uh, well, I'd like to spend some time uh, taking some courses at the university. I was always very hesitant to do it when my husband was head of the department. <laughs> but I don't, I, without, um, I, I, this is something I would really love to do. I, I find it very exhilarating to um, have a chance to be involved in, in uh, lectures and to do some research. And I always think, why don't I spend more time doing this? And so that's something that I really would like to look forward to doing. And you have a beautiful backyard and yard at, at your place outside of Iowa City. Well, would we you really like to be more, <laughs> spend more time there? Well, I certainly would. It's, um, it's, it's now, with these years, you see, it becomes a problem of how do you manage it so that mm -hmm. as you grow older and perhaps uh, less vigorous or less 
uh, strong, um, you have to have reduce the, the labor that's involved. And we've been working on uh, shifting uh, the focus of our gardening from f so many plants to shrubs. And uh, Frank is very, has long had a love affair with tree peonies. And so we're gradually uh, adding tree peonies to the garden. And so it'll become uh, a, more of a shrub garden. But he also is very devoted to daylilies, which, and I'm devoted to hostas. And so this makes for a garden that is not too difficult to keep up, but is very rewarding. Um, there are always these, uh, even in a garden, you see a garden is really an artwork. That's one of the things that I enjoy. A hosta garden is like a great green collage. Mm -hmm. And um, the working out the relationships of the sizes of plants and the colors and the textures of the leaves and planting them in a way that is attractive, it's like a, it's, it's part of the landscape, you know, it's, it's just irresistible. So that's how really my, my art efforts get translated into, <laughs> into a garden these days. I've seen your peonies and they are mag and yes. your hostas are yes. magnificent. In all of your all of the things that we've talked about, you've mentioned that your children were off to, to college. Just share briefly about you have four children and a couple yes. grandchildren and where they are. Well, um, Grace, our oldest, teaches at the University of Rochester. I'm sure she's an art history professor. And it's in the gene code, too, <laughs> isn't it? That's right. And um, Franklin uh, is here in Iowa City. He's a computer programmer with the systems development of the hospital. Uh, Christopher, is in, uh, he works for the Harvard Medical School Extension Service and lives in Sharon, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, has two boys, one 18, and one is about 15, 17 months now. Uh, and um, then my uh, younger one is married and lives in British Columbia at uh, 100 Mile House, which is about 250 miles north of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And British Columbia, it's a pleasure to visit her there because British Columbia is so thrilling. We just love to go there. And you used to, or do you still go up north to a very primitive, remote place and spend some of your summers? Do you still do that? Well, we, we don't do it in the way we used to. We now, we were on an island, which is, that became too difficult for us to manage. Where was that? Manage. It's a uh, hundred miles north of the Sioux, Sioux St. Marie, mm -hmm. Ontario, in an area, it's called, um, it's in the Agua Bay area, and it's where Lake, Provin Lake uh, Superior Provincial Park is. Mm. Uh, this is untouched, pristine landscape, absolutely beautiful, and not a place where there are the summer places are usually uh, located. There are a few houses that have been there, but there are four cabins that have been there for maybe oh 40 years, but not much longer than that because mm -hmm. it was it's hard. There wasn't even a highway. The Trans Canada Highway didn't go through there until 1960, so <laughs> the only way you could get to these places was by boat. And we uh, spent, um, we discovered this area first in, in 51, mm -hmm. and uh, have the children grew old. We uh, spent our summers there, and the children love it. And we have uh, some pictures that show the extent of the lake, which is uh, uh, just a wonderful memory for all of us. Mm. And, but you'd go, you don't go there any longer? Well, we, we visit, and we walk in the park, and we, do we live there in a different, we visit in a different way, different because way. It's, it, you can't detach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. And so these are, um, and the children come up and they c when they can, but they've been very busy and haven't been able to spend so much time. But they also are devoted to the area, so they can. Uh, their uh, the cabins that they have is something that takes two or, or at least four of them to manage, so they have to get together as a group to do it. And this is what they like to do. It's a wonderful place for them to get together, and we you visit them there. You do love the outdoors and nature. Yes, I, I always have. I you know. The first time I ever met you, you were pruning a tree with your, <laughs> with your <laughs> jeans on and your uh -huh. good sturdy shoes. And, oh, yes. And Iowa City is much richer for all of your efforts. Thank you for being my guest, Nancy. Thank you. My guest today has been Nancy Cyberling, art enthusiast, energetic supporter of Iowa City's environment, and one of the co-founders of Project Green. Her love of nature, her commitment to a tasteful civic design, her ability to envision projects and see them to completion has enhanced our surroundings and our community, and we thank her for her efforts.